June 2000, Fine Gael contest a hard-fought by-election in South Tipperary. But as the activists line out for battle, a group within the party were hatching a plot to get rid of their leader. One particular guy, but there were lots more like him. He came to me and he says, how do we get rid of this fellow brute? And he says, how do we get rid of him? I felt that he had been taken out by men of lesser intellects and lesser abilities than he had. I felt there had been a certain amount of treachery involved. It was very unfair to do this to him. I really, I really was, I suppose, gutted and angry. Within the year, one leader would be dumped and another installed, but to little effect. Michael Noonan would lead a party more divided than ever. I'm convinced that people within the party were involved in the leaking of information. And the motivation was to damage my leadership. In June 1997, after just two and a half years in government, John Bruton's rainbow came to an end. A gain of nine seats in that summer's election wasn't enough to keep Fine Gael in power, and Bertie Ahern's precarious coalition proved surprisingly stable. I think there was a significant shell shock. I think in the early stages of that government, people looked at the ragbag of independents that were propping up the government and said, this thing won't last. But I think it, it became apparent within probably the first 12 months that it would probably last and go three or four, as it turned out, five years. Being leader of an opposition party is a terribly hard job. You know, your good performances seem to be quickly forgotten and your f flaws tend to be cast up in front of you an awful lot. The John couldn't address the problems of the party, that, that, that he saw himself and the party as literally inseparable. Uh, and you just couldn't deal in a reasonable way with these sort of issues at front bench level or indeed in person discussions with them. Adrift in opposition, the party's cherished reputation for honesty and integrity was also under attack. Michael Lowry, the party fundraiser whom Bruton had appointed to cabinet, was in 1997 called before the McCracken Tribunal. His financial dealings with businessman Ben Dunn were, it discovered, designed to evade substantial amounts of tax. It was a very traumatic experience, a very difficult experience for my family, for myself personally, uh, for, for John Bruton in particular, and for the Fine Gael party. I had a, a fantastic relationship with John Bruton, and I knew that he was hurting, and the fact that he was hurting hurt me. Larry's involvement at the highest levels within the party opened up embarrassing investigations into Fine Gael's finances. His decision as minister to award a mobile phone license to party donor Dennis O'Brien is still under investigation and could yet prove devastating to the party. John Bruton sat in the public gallery listening to... Certainly, I'm sure even John Bruton at this stage would acknowledge uh, that appointing Mike Lowry to government was a major mistake. And, it's, and that particular appointment has, I believe, done huge damage to the Fine Gael party up to this very day. In late 2000, with the party fading in the opinion polls, John Bruton needed a bold initiative to revive Fine Gael's flagging morale. When I think of the Celtic snail, I suppose it was um, it like drink to the another huge disaster. The Celtic snail was meant to represent the downside of the Celtic tiger. People were richer, but had their quality of life improved? For many, though, Fine Gael was the Celtic snail. I remember going to John and saying, John, there's a danger, you know, that the head and that snail could chain, that your head could be put up in it. Genuinely, when I saw that Celtic snail, I thought that some smart aleck in a graphics company who had Fianna Fáil family connection and decided to do a wind-up on Fine Gael, I thought it was bizarre. I thought it was a very bad, badly organised campaign. But when it was presented to the front bench, I asked, was it, was it for decision purposes or were we being informed? And it transpired that we were being informed that the decisions had been made and the dates had been fixed and the advertising was, was placed. It's fair to say Michael was quiet and he wasn't really participating much 
in the sort of leadership of the party. I mean, normally the party spokesman in finance would be very much kind of up front and working with the leader. It hadn't escaped John Bruton's attention that the Celtic snail wasn't the only issue that Michael Noonan had a problem with. Well, you pick these things up, you know, you can see that people are, should we say, not as forthcoming at meetings, not as much uh, engaged in, in, in the team process, uh, being sort of reticent and quiet and hanging back when they ought to be contributing. A group was beginning to form around Michael Noonan, largely comprised of disgruntled backbenchers. I had been listening to people moaning and groaning about John and saying how he must go and how he'll never, he won't get elected again. We have no hope as long as he remains leader. I'd been listening to this from a clear majority of parliamentary party. Austin DC was always, I suppose, uh, cranky might be the wrong word, but he was always a sort of a man with his own views and we were afraid to express them. Acting alone, in November 2000, Austin DC put down a motion of no confidence on Bruton's leadership. I feel that we'll do badly under John Bruton, that he can take it or leave it, but I'm just giving him that opportunity. But when it came to the vote, Bruton's enemy weren't sufficiently organised to muster in support for his removal. They bided their time. I have to question now those people why they didn't have courage to sort of take that ball when Austin DC hopped it. Not alone did they vote for John Bruton, but they actually said he was a great leader and he should never be removed. These were people who only weeks beforehand had been saying he must go. Well, after the Austin DC's motion was defeated, because nobody knew it was coming up and it was taken very quickly, a lot of the people in the party decided they were going to have a change anyway. And um, it was put to me in the bluntest terms that I either became part of the change or they'd change for somebody else, you know. Over Christmas 2000, Noonan and his supporters began to lay the groundwork for another push, canvassing wavering members of the parliamentary party. I knew there was a uh, a series of meetings going on to assess the level of support or otherwise for a motion of no confidence and I alerted the party leader about that. To win, Noonan knew he needed to broaden his support base within the party. He turned to Jim Mitchell, a long-time critic of John Bruton. At the House of Noonan's secretary in West Dublin, the deal's done. We came to an arrangement that we'd not ask backbenchers to put down motions and no confidence that we'd do it ourselves. And that subsequently we'd both contest the leadership. And that whoever was selected leader would have the other as his deputy. The so-called dream team left little to chance, even canvassing the deputy leader. I would have said to Jim, I just don't think this is the time to be changing our leader. We had a chance in November and we didn't do it. And I really think this is, this is madness. There were hints to me that you know, I didn't have to go down with the ship, as it were, if there was a change in leadership. But I wasn't biting. In January came the trigger. A poll put Fine Gael at just 19%, a long way from the 40% share under Garrett Fitzgerald. Alan Shatter fired the first shot. There does come a time in Irish politics uh, when all of us in politics must consider the appropriateness of the positions we hold, whether uh, continuing to hold them is in, in the interests of the country, is in the interests of the party you serve. The results of this opinion poll came out 15 or 20 minutes before we went on air in the Olivia O'Leary programme. I, I was asked a question about the poll and instead of engaging in political waffle, I decided to just truthfully express my concern about the predicament Fine Gael was in. John Bruton accepted the poll was something of a setback. Well, I am quite disappointed, to be honest. There was a sort of a sense of gloom and foreboding at stage because I think this would be the worst poll for some time. And I think John was pessimistic himself at that stage. He, could, he, 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 he was always resilient in the face of bad opinion polls because he'd been facing them for so long. But I think he was nearly ground down at this stage by the constant drip, drip and the media obsession about his leadership. Alan Shatter's well-timed attack opened the way for the so-called dream team to go public the following Sunday. 
and so began an intense four-day battle for the party leadership. It's gone to the stage now where it's difficult to find party activists who support the present leader. I was without hesitation in deciding that I would confront that challenge head on. I believe it's very important not only that I fight this but that I win. Michael Noonan says you're going nowhere, you'll finish the party. Anybody who could say that hasn't much respect for Fine Gael. There are very few, if any, donos left. I will win the vote. My managers believe that we have a majority. I've devoted my life to Fine Gael. I have made up my mind, Charlie. I'm a man of steel. And when will you be And announced? your information is that you don't know. I'm a man with guts. I'm a man who stands for what With I the vote stacking up in favour of Noonan, Bruton's allies were pessimistic about his chances. People like Phil Hogan were encouraging him a little bit with sort of probably a small amount of false optimism saying, you know, you can still do it. Privately, they knew the game was up. Knowing he was facing likely defeat, John Bruton faced his party on Wednesday afternoon. All of his private office staff were, were on the corridor just saying, good luck, go for it. This is it. It was, it was like sending a boxer into the ring, really. Um, and I think privately we knew it was an uphill struggle. I, I wished him luck and I said, John, I think you probably will be pipped. It was like a good old fashioned Fianna Fáil parliamentary party when George Colley and Charlie Hoy were fighting it out. There was blood all over the floor. It was ugly. Some of the deputies were quite personal in saying that uh, his uh, face on the poster would yield uh, negative electoral results for the party in the following general election. I indicated that I felt it was time for a change, that I felt we needed a new uh, man or woman at the helm. Really there was nothing being offered. There was just a let's make a change, as if in some sort of magic way making a change was going to, on its own, do something. Oh, it was, it was very emotional and I, and I know that many of us, including John, were close to tears. One TD actually said that the reason he was voting against John Bruton was because he didn't attend a funeral of some party activist um, in, in, in the west of Ireland. And really, I think at that stage, it was probably time to, 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 to call the vote and have it done. Meet our Waterloo. Following a vote of no confidence in my leadership proposed by uh, Deputy Jim Mitchell and seconded by Deputy Michael Noonan, uh, which was carried, uh, in a secret ballot. I have uh, resigned as leader of the Fine Gael party. Everybody was very emotional. Most of them, I mean, we were all crying and just quite defiant in a way. Um, we had a few drinks. John was, was, was quite dignified in it, more so than most of the people around him were. Then I went home and I got a big hug from my wife and kids. And I, my, the, well, the girls were there. Matthew wasn't there at the time. Uh, that was it. The new leader of Fine Gael is Deputy Michael Noonan. Love is a burning thing that makes a fiery ring. They were so impatient to recover what they thought was the advantage of having a charismatic leader that they dumped John Bruton and, uh, with, with, without clearly seeing around the corner um, that they hadn't got um, somebody, uh, a second Gareth Fitzgerald, lurking in the wings, who was going to bring them back to their, their previous glories. The new Fine Gael leader will not announce his front bench until Thursday. Now the deputy from Limerick was firmly in charge. Rivals for the leadership, like Enda Kenny, along with allies of the former leader, were dropped from the front bench. He'd already informed all the people who were going to be on it before he came in to me and said, there isn't going to be a place for you. And I said, well, I pretty well worked that out for myself. The newly elected leader had ambitious plans to revitalise his party. Noonan's key initiative was to ban corporate donations to political parties, putting clear blue water between himself and Bertie Ahern. I want to break any perception 
that a small group have undue influence over the political process. Taking on the popular Taoiseach seemed to be Noonan's greatest challenge. But what happened next convinced him that his biggest enemies lay within his own party. I was taking over the party as the new leader. I met the chairman of the trustees. And he was telling me about the finances of the party, that everything was in order. While we weren't in a very strong position, we weren't in any difficulties either. And then he told me uh, about this check. The murky legacy of the Lowry era suddenly returned to haunt Michael Noonan. A check for $50,000 from the consortium which had been awarded the lucrative mobile phone license by Michael Lowry was lying in the safe at party headquarters. The check hadn't been cashed, nor had it been disclosed to the tribunal. There was legal advice given to John Bruton that um, there was no need to report this to the Moriarty Tribunal. It wasn't within the remit of Moriarty, but I mean, I don't have a legal background, but my sense told me that it was something that should be reported in Prudence, and I instructed that this would be done. But before Noonan could come clean, somebody tipped off the papers about the secret donation. Clearly, it was leaked by somebody. Uh, in my view, um, for no other reason than to damage Michael Noonan. And things really went downhill after that. I think Michael had probably lost his confidence halfway through his first year. The revelations threw Noonan's leadership off course. And a few months later, there was another embarrassing leak. For years, Fine Gael had been making under-the-counter cash payments to staff. I am convinced that people within the party were involved in the leaking of the information about the payments without tax being deducted. And the motivation was to damage my leadership. With his leadership under attack, Michael Noonan retreated behind a barrier of trusted aides. Michael Noonan became very remote uh, after he took over the leadership, which was surprising because Michael Noonan had always been accessible. I don't think he was close to anybody on the Fine Gael front bench. I think that, that was the problem. He wasn't uh, on close terms with his deputy leader, Jim Mitchell. The attendance of parliamentary party meetings died off too. Rather than it being lifted by a new leader, I think it actually began to die off again. Michael Noonan leaving the podium and walking down... As the months ticked away to election 2002, another problem from the past returned to haunt Michael Noonan. A decision he had made years earlier as Minister for Health was about to catch up with him. Could her solicitors not in selecting a test case from the hundreds of hepatitis C cases on their books Select a plaintiff in a better... In 1996, Noonan had been widely criticised for allowing state lawyers to aggressively pursue a woman dying from hepatitis C. If we are to review the conduct by the state, have not the solicitors for the plaintiff a case to answer also? I can't listen to this. Now, in January 2002, a drama based on the events was being aired on RTE. The minister's statement is disgrace and an insult, not least to the memory of Mrs McFadden. He will have to apologise or resign. The portrayal of me was fiction. It wasn't in accordance with the fact. Even the events portrayed, uh, some of them didn't happen at all, and others were twisted and distorted to show me in the worst possible light. I thought it was a very unfair piece of broadcasting. Uh, but if I put that to RTE, even today they'll say, but Michael, you understand drama. Drama is different from documentary. Things don't have to be accurate in drama. We do things for dramatic effect, which are not necessarily true. So they're saying sorry, that they give me money, and it'll all be forgotten, is that it? They also say that if we proceed with our case for aggravated and punitive damages, and if you lose, they'll chase you for those costs too. And I thought it was an outrageous decision to put that out so close to an election. Uh, on the other hand, I don't believe it had an electoral effect. It had an incredibly negative effect on women. And the feelings that it aroused in them was uh, a mortal blow, particularly for Michael Noonan and also for the party in an election year. It was beginning to look like Fianna Foil and the PDs would run away with the election. But the coalition partners were exposed on one vital issue. It was blindingly obvious to anyone who knew how to add 
and who had any interest in the country's finances, that the government had let things slip horrendously. I would have advised Fine Gael of this privately and said, this is, you have a role, not unlike what was there in 1981-82, of being one step ahead of the game and telling the people the simple, raw truth. But Noonan ignored the advice. Rather than attack the government's overspending, he tried to buy votes by promising to compensate Aircom shareholders who had lost money. I was absolutely shocked. It was utterly counter to everything that I believed. It was utterly counter to everything that I thought Fine Gael was in favour of. And it was, I think, a crystallising moment in many people's minds. It was extraordinarily unwise. Noonan's Aircom pledge also came as a surprise to even his closest advisers. Regrettably, it has happened on a number of occasions that my advice has been given after the fact because I wasn't consulted beforehand. Isn't that a diplomatic answer? They didn't do the job they should have done. Uh, I think that uh, they had a duty to expose the mess that had been made of our finances uh, by Charles McCreevy, and they chose not to do so, and instead to promise like Fianna Fáil more money for this, that and the other. The Aircom pledge appalled many Fine Gael supporters, and Jim Mitchell was about to compound the error. Without telling Noonan, he announced that taxi drivers who'd lost out during deregulation should also be compensated. Jim Mitchell started announcing various schemes like, you know, compensating the taxi drivers. Just the complete antithesis of what Fine Gael was supposed to be about economically. And I think the two men, well, if they didn't fall out exactly, there was certainly a big division between them, which led to Mitchell being sidelined for the duration of the election. I think that we have to look back on the situation regarding the late Jim Mitchell in hindsight and that's how everybody knew that he wasn't a well man. Uh, he was major responsibilities and working exceptionally hard. So he floated a lot of ideas in the run-up to the general election and there was been a number of disagreements at front bench meetings about these issues. Which of you has the X factor in What does X stand for? We want to sail you to victory on Friday the 17th of May. Whatever hope Noonan had of forming a pre-election pact with Labour was effectively scuppered by the compensation pledges. I mean, Fine Gael came out with, with some nonsense proposals. The proposal to compensate the telecom shareholders was like putting a stall outside Lapristown and saying, all losers over here, please, you know. It was clear that Labour weren't prepared to make any kind of pre-election arrangement with us. That came to a head just before uh, the general election. Uh, when we knew it was going to be called within 24 hours, uh, I asked Rory Quinn uh, to, to, to have a chat about how we'd conduct the campaign. My recollection of it was not so much what he said, but the intensity of desperation with which it was said. I tried again to get an agreement on some kind of common platform and uh, as a last resort, even to get an agreement on uh, the exchange of votes. I said, Michael, I understand what you're saying, I understand why you're saying it, but we have a position, we have a policy platform. I want to try and get a mandate for this from the Irish electorate. I don't want it submerged in fudge. So I said, Rory, uh, the result of what you're saying to me is that neither you nor I will lead our parties by Christmas. I wish to inform the House Count Coyle as a matter of courtesy that I intend to proceed to Orson Uteron at 9am tomorrow morning to advise the President to dissolve that Ireland and to summon the incoming doll to meet. We'll be in government in about a fortnight. <laughs> And so the scene was set for the most disastrous Fine Gael election performance in half a century. Well, I remember there was one point when I was following uh, Bertie around the campaign trail. I was going down a, a high street of some town and Bertie almost knocked me over in his drive to get from one side of the street to somebody he needed to shake. He was, like, incredible. Noonan, it was like 
a stroll in a country lane. It was just nice and quiet and uh, after lunch one time, Noonan just went for a walk beside a pond where there were ducks, you know, like this was in mid-campaign. Cam it certainly wasn't, however, as Mr Noonan arrived to canvas in Boyle County, Roscommon. One of the lowest points was the incident in Boyle. It was done at a time and an occasion where it got full coverage from photographers and cameras and obviously some people were aware that it was going to happen. He'd just begun his walkabout when a young woman smashed a custard pie in his face. <laughs> they were all low points. I'd normally have my dessert after my chips. <laughs> Certainly what came out on the 6 o'clock news that evening and the way Michael Newland recovered from it was admired by people. People weren't attracted to Michael Noonan as the leader. And they were saying, you know, why, you know, ironically they were saying, why did you change your leader uh, from John Bruton to Michael Noonan? You know, he hasn't done any good and he hasn't changed the party. Instead of playing to his strengths, which is a tough, no-nonsense guy, they tried to transform his personality into uh, like some sort of monk. He was going around the place with a beatific smile on his face and a soft voice, and it didn't fool anybody for a second. Michael Noonan wasn't connecting with the public, and the polls reflected it. Fianna Foyle seemed to be on course for their first overall majority since 1977. Uh, a friend of mine said to me one night in a bar, he says, Fianna Fáil or beer? Finnegal or wine. The beer thing is that they're where people are and that's where they're capturing the mood or somebody that is advising them is out there at least. And we seem to be that couple of years late with our with the ideas that have been brought to us at election time. Now after years of economic growth the electorate were turning against the opposition and the progressive Democrats were about to become the real beneficiaries. The posters that we put, uh, put up on, on lampposts were a single party government, no thanks. That was a, a very simple, clear message at a time when people were making up their minds as to what kind of government they were, uh, they were going to choose. Fine Gael were effectively uh, the political wallflowers of the election. You wouldn't need uh, to be Einstein to work out that a lot of mobile votes in Ireland were likely to abandon Fine Gael. We're ready. We're ready as we have never been before. We have the vision, we have the policies, we have the people, we have the organisation. We are going to win this general election. huge standing ovation for a very interesting and a very challenging speech from the leader. Today truly is the big day when we find out just who are the winners and losers in this general election. But of course we already have had the first 12 TDs elected to the 29th Doyle thanks to three electronic cards. The count centre was an absolute disaster. No, no, no results. And when we were getting near to the end of the count, they said, well, the candidates, please come up. The cameras were all trained on us and on John Fitzpatrick, and he announced the four people who got elected. Trevor Sargent. Yeah! Yeah! Uh, Sean Ryan. Yeah! Jim Glennon and yeah! so That's how I heard. I just put my hand up to my eyes and Sean Ryan put his arm around me and I just, sort of the camera started to flash. I didn't burst into tears or anything, but I, I just felt a kind of weakness and I just heard a gasp. And that is a surprise. The whole thing was so terrible that even if I'd had a chance for my own self to kind of get on the platform and say, thank all the people. I mean, I was going out of the doll after 19 years. It wasn't nice to just drift away like that. Mary Wallace, Dana Paul. I was listening to the radio. The results came in. Uh, I knew immediately that we were going to have a very bad day the following day. 
Charlie Flanagan's vote is down by three or four percentage points. Despite that, he should be safe. I was up early on the morning of the count, um, not having slept all that well I might add, having seen Nora's, Nora's demise in Dublin North. And the boxes were open at nine o'clock. I didn't go down to the count centre, but I got a phone call at ten past nine, and I heard on the radio, I think at twenty to ten, that I wasn't doing well in rural leash. Now that's four of the five seats, and we haven't yet mentioned Funaghan. Their vote has collapsed, it seems, to a historic low of around 15 and a half percent. That Fine Gael sitting TD, Austin Curry, will not be returning to the 29th vote. Fine Gael are now in meltdown territory. I mean, your candidates are suffering at the hands of the PDs, at the hands of Labour, and at the hands of Fine Gael. As the results are coming in, I spent most of the day out in RTE with a sad heart, and uh, it was hard to believe that um, so many of the front bench, the better known names in the party, were falling right around the country. I didn't think in the end, uh, you know, before the count happened, uh, that I would actually lose my seat. I got gazumped uh, to an extent by the electorate. They, they made, they implemented the decision for me a few years before I had intended to do it myself. But, uh, so, uh, exclude Mr. Jukes and I think Mr. Jack Wall to be elected. Yeah! Alan Jukes can't make it. That's another big shock, isn't it? It's an absolute disaster for them. Fine a yeah. meltdown. If it's not a meltdown, it's something very close to it. Yeah, uh, it's certainly a disastrous showing for us. I was uh, surprised that in virtually every case where there was a possibility of a loss, it happened. Uh, it was quite, quite disastrous. As the votes of Tom Parland exceed the quota, I deem him to be elected. <laughs> Finnegill voter, my vote didn't hold up. Democrats and from, from Tom Carlin, who took about 2,000 votes, and from Charles Flanagan, uh, and I think that's what explains Charles Flanagan's demise. And I was out. Gone. This is the Finnegill front bench, and this is what has happened to them. Ten of them uh, have gone to Jim Mitchell, Alan Jukes, oh, Charles. It was, it was devastation. It was Good Friday. You know, uh, it was. It, couldn't believe big names losing their seats, people that you thought were infallible. It's the elite of Fine Gael. It's so much of the front bench that has vanished. Who's the one most at well, risk? Well, it's difficult to call it. Uh, the Kenny looks like most at risk, but at the same time... You know, you didn't want to watch the television. You wanted to just go in and be with yourself and your thoughts. What certainly is that Bertie Hart is going to be theatre. I packed my bag. I drove west and I walked in the borough, stayed up late, walked again the next morning, and um, hung up my political boots. I was made leader on the basis that I would rescue the party, so I didn't, so I thought the consequences were obvious. I don't see uh, that uh, I'm tenable as a leader of the party after such a bad result. You know, we timed it so that it would run for the nine o'clock news. That was it. By the Sunday, there had been dead Fine Gael bodies all over the shop and no real explanation. Uh, I just felt like kind of going home and it's taking it easy and it's duck taking and just wondering, you know, what, what the future, what the future held. For over a year, Michael Noonan's successor, Enda Kenny, has been touring the country, trying to revive Fine Gael's fortunes after the devastation of election 2002. You know, it's very, it's very difficult in politics to get people to rise up and be motivated shortly after a campaign that was, uh, that, that was, as I said, such a hammer blow uh, around the country. Politics is a rough business in Ireland. It's a very rough business. And it's a 20-hour 20, a 20 day, uh, and you just never know what's going to happen. People should be able to get into our city centre from Lucan, to leave at half past eight and be at their, uh, their desks by nine. 
I just think the quality of life for our children is going to be greatly diminished. Rail, road, schools, amenities and facilities. That's precisely the problem. This is where the real battle is for Fine Gael. Urban areas like Lucan, where support for the party has reached rock bottom. In 1982, Fine Gael won 23 seats in Dublin. Last year, they held just three. We did a major report on the internal structures of the party. I hope this week to announce the formation of a Dublin task force. Which what we said to the party is, there are a lot of things you have to do. And if you do them, there is a great prospect of success because windows of opportunity are about to open up very significantly in society by political parties. But if you don't, if you do not begin to understand the true dynamic of what's happening around you and what's happening to you, you have nowhere to go but down. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. For Enda Kenny's reforms to succeed, he needs to project a clear vision of what his party stands for. Fine Gael policies have been veering from left to right and back again for over a decade. The Green Party stands for ecology, the environment and all that. Um, and we know what Sinn Féin stands for and the Labour Party. Well, so is there any Fine slogan? Fine Gael is just, uh, Fine, well, I, um, my slogan for Fine Gael is that we stand for a fairer Ireland where opportunity exists for everybody. Where are you? Put are it, you a Christian Democrat? Are you a Social Democrat? Are Fine, you in the centre? Where are you? Fine Gael are lined up with the European People's Party in Europe. That is a Christian Democratic movement. Half of them describe themselves as Christian Democrats and the other half describe themselves as Social Democrats. Uh, and th these two labels seem to mean something to a lot of people in Fine Gael. But in the rest of Europe, the distinction between Christian Democrat and Social Democrat is obsolete. It's dead. Fine Gael is in a marketplace which is it, with, with a, a, a product which nobody wants because it doesn't have a product, really have a product that's unique. Like, if the public wanted some kind of left liberalism, it would vote Labour. If it wanted central liberalism, it would vote Fianna Fáil. If it wants conservatism, it would vote PDs. The Fianna Gael are surplus to requirements because they don't have a definite policy in anything. At a special delegate conference in February, the new leadership attempts to fill that policy vacuum. The party is using the breathing space before the next election to radically rethink the issues which could make it a relevant political force again. I think there is. Um, unfortunately, I think politically we've been in denial when it comes to alcohol and alcohol abuse in the country. 80% of street violence is directly linked to alcohol problems. And some very hard decisions are going to have to be made. The question, I think, is Fine Gael ready and capable of taking these on? Well, actually, Fine Gael is an exciting and a very good place to be right now. And there's no other political party that has this similar experience. And the world is there to be conquered. I mean, there's a new island to be created. That's what we're discussing at Front Bench right now. Long-term advisers believe that Fine Gael should be making the most of the opportunities to attack the government. I mean, holy God, the health services don't work. There's no serious division on it. There's nobody out actually screaming and campaigning to get some of the problems sorted out and yet the problems are that acute. That is extraordinary. Uh, now John DC, our spokesman on justice, has been doing quite an extensive amount of work in this area. In fairness to Andy Kenny, he's still in the process of, of putting his team together and, and so on. But I don't sense that they have come up with uh, you know, the, the equivalence of Fianna Fáil and the PJ Mara, the Martin Mackins, who are very ambitious men themselves. We've detailed different front bench members to come forward with action programmes. They don't have that hunger, you know. They don't have that hunger that, that Fianna Fáil has. And I think the absolute proof of that is that the last time they were elected into power was in 1982. Fine Gael have gone from a high point of 70 seats under Garrett Fitzgerald to today's tally of just 31. But if these were the best of times for Fine Gael, they ultimately left the party weaker. Fitzgerald's liberal agenda attracted new talent, but it cost Fine Gael an old, loyal following. And the economic turmoil of the 80s also damaged the party's reputation. Once Fitzgerald was gone, Fine Gael struggled in vain to hold its competing identities together. 
have to say, I think Fine Gael has a very, very difficult and uncertain future. Um, they were a social democratic party for a brief period. They have been a law and order party. They've been a catch-all party, they've been a niche party, they've been a farmer's party, they've been a business party. They're now at the moment a party searching for an identity. In Dublin Castle, the Moriarty Tribunal grinds on. If it were to conclude that a Fine Gael minister awarded a state license corruptly, it would be devastating for the party. Separately, at the Flood Tribunal, the grandson of the party's founder has resigned from Fine Gael after failing to declare money he received from a lobbyist. Recent events, I think, have, have damaged the Fine Gael party because um, that one trump card that in the last analysis uh, they were uh, less crooked and more honest than their opponents has been uh, taken out of their hand by the recent uh, revelations in the tribunals. I am very pessimistic. I am very pessimistic with what I, I, I see currently. I would doubt if there's the capacity among the elected politicians to make the kind of change that's needed. I mean, if, for instance, Fine Gael in the next election increased its support by 50%, it still wouldn't be in government. Fine Gael will still be returned. That's a disaster facing the country. The challenge of reinventing Fine Gael falls squarely on Enda Kenny's shoulders. In recent months, there have been some small signs of recovery. Kenny, at least, has one major advantage over his predecessors. The bitter fights over the leadership that have plagued the party for so long are now finally settled. It was only with the advent of Enda Kenny that we have a totally united party again, where there is no crown pretender out there who thinks he should be leader now uh, and is actively kind of wondering what his opportunities are. So that's another seriously plus point for Fine Gael in this next phase. He's a man of very good IQ, intelligent and, and um, very fast learner. Does all of that up to is Andy Kenny a great political leader? Time will tell. What I think he has is he has an enormous number of the ingredients. Let me introduce to you the leader of the Fine Gael Party, the next teacher of this country, Andy Kenny. Fine Gael have been central to Irish politics since the foundation of the state. But the past two decades have seen Ireland change dramatically. If the party cannot match that change, there are no guarantees that Fine Gael will play a role in Ireland's future. The time is coming for Fine Gael to be much more courageous, much more forceful in advocating a distinctive view of society, in saying things that are right but unpopular. And in that way, we'll gain definition People will gain respect for us and we'll make progress. Let them know out there that Fine Gael has got its bottle back. There is no such thing as the floor to the political support you have. The floor, in fact, is no votes at all. The floor is zero. From Michael Collins to Enda Kenny. It's not a party which is urban, liberal, left of centre anymore. And um, that's the dilemma which um, confronts it at the moment. And. Um, I imagine that the next general election will be um, a make-or-break event for Fine Gael. They're writing in the papers that Kenny is a nice guy. <laughs> but has he got the bottle? I think that, that after the devastation of the last election, there is hunger creeping back into the party again. You'll see um, Fine Gael emerging again slowly local elections in a year's time or whatever and so on and you know they'll be back I'd say. If you believe of the importance of giving people a real choice when the next election... I mean, if you ask me what's the future of the party, I don't know what the future of politics is. I've been talked happily about the past because I know what happened. I don't know what's going to happen in the future. That's a matter for the people who are there now to do something about it. I just know that I hope that there will be an alternative government offering an alternative view and key policies in the future. The answer is always in our hands. In our hands, go and do it. Thank you very much indeed.
are now like mongrel foxes, they're gone to ground. And I'll dig them out, the pack will chop them when they get them. Never have we been stronger, more united, and more determined. Out, out. We have just ruined the country. Just leave to Desi O'Malley, he's going to do it. It's gone to the stage now where it's difficult to find party activists who support the present leader. was the final programme in the series. Next Monday night at 9.25, it's movie time with My Husband's Double Life, the bizarre true story of a woman who realises she's lived a life for a decade. After the break, Elvis is alive and well and about to meet up with Frasier. Elvis Costello, that is.